Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Is Transit-Oriented Development Affordable for Low and Moderate Income Households? My name is Brendan Williams. I am the Research Program Administrator at Portland State University's Transportation Research and Education Center. TREK leads the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, a university transportation center funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. NITSE consortium members are the University of Utah, University of Oregon, University of Arizona, University of Texas at Arlington, and the Oregon Institute of Technology. NITSE's research priority is improving the mobility of people and goods to build strong communities. Our presenters today are Reed Ewing and Justina Kavnaska from the University of Utah. Reed is a distinguished professor of city and metropolitan planning at the University of Utah. His research focuses on the built environment at five different scales and its impacts on quality of life. Justina is a second year master's student in the city and metropolitan planning program. She plans to enter a, a PhD program next fall. Uh, before I turn this over to our presenters, we have a, a few other online events coming up. Tomorrow, February 16th from 2 to 3.30 Pacific time is a transportation data webinar, video image processing technology for bikes and pedestrians, presented by Sean Quayle from Washington County and Chase Hilder from DKS Associates. On February 18th from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Pacific time is a Friday transportation seminar, Systematic Opportunities to Improve Older Pedestrian Safety, presented by Sharisha Kothuri and Jason Anderson from Portland State University. Our next, our next NITSE webinar is on Thursday, March 10th from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time. Exploring Data Fusion Techniques to Derive Bicycle Volumes on a Network. It's all, uh, presented by Sharisha Kothuri again, and Joe Broach from Portland State University, and also Kate Hume from the University of Texas at Arlington. I'm gonna turn this over to Reed and Justina in a moment. Uh, this presentation will be about 40 minutes long. Then we'll have about 15 minutes to answer your questions. During the presentation, feel free to submit your questions via the Zoom Q&A. Um, the chat will, will not help us um, organize the questions for later on, so um, please use the Q&A. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to the video recording and presentation slides. If you're tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. Instructions on how to redeem the credit will be included in your post webinar email. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Reed. Well, hopefully, hopefully, you're going to see my slides now. Yes. Uh, everything okay? Yeah, well, thank you, Brendan. Um, and thank you all for attending. Uh, as Brendan said, the title is, is Transit-Oriented Development Affordable for Low and Moderate Income Households? Uh, this is really Justina's project. She's done a phenomenal amount of work. I'll, I'll lead off with some background. Uh, this is not the first time NITSI has funded work on TOD. Um, uh, there may be projects other than ours, but we did, um, with NITSE funding, a, a trip and parking generation study, which I'm going to refer to at um, five TODs around the country. Uh, then we added a sixth, the Renko Station, and a seventh, Mockingbird Station. These, uh, will, for those of you who are into TOD, are some of the highest profile uh, TODs in the country, uh, the first five and then the two I just mentioned. Uh, and we hired students and they went out and they counted cars and they counted uh, people uh, and they counted parking spaces uh, and did um, intercept surveys. 
So we know a fair amount about the transportation side of TOD. Uh, what we're adding today is information on the housing side of TOD. So the um, standard, the nominal standard of affordability, as you know, as everyone knows, is 30% household income for housing. What you probably don't know uh, from the Center for Neighborhood Technologies is that affordable transportation, they define it as 15% or less of uh, household income. So the sum of the two, the 30 plus the 15 would be 45% uh, of income for housing plus transportation. And that would be considered affordable. And if the sum of the two is 60% or 70%, that would be considered unaffordable. We've done <clears throat> some studies of affordability, uh, the upper right, a uh, study was done of HUD programs, which are affordable by definition when it comes to uh, housing. Uh, there are 30% of the household income goes to housing, but that doesn't mean if they're located, if the, if the subsidized units are located in the suburbs uh, without good transit, that doesn't mean that transportation is affordable at 15% of household income. We've also looked at sprawl and its effect. And what we found is that uh, housing is more expensive in cities than suburbs, uh, but uh, transportation is much less of, uh, pricey in, in cities than it is in, in suburbs. So the sum of the two actually favors cities. Uh, interesting finding. So if you're gonna put affordable housing somewhere, uh, put it in cities because you're gonna save on, on transportation. Our, our TOD definition comes from Robert Cervero, who uh, is well known, I'm sure, to most of the people attending. He's, he is the guy uh, internationally in the area of TOD. He goes all over the world, studies it, uh, gives presentations, and he defined TOD as, why, as compact mixed use development near transit facilities with high quality walking environments. Uh, we, we added a few uh, additional criteria, uh, the most important of which is that the TOD be adjacent to the transit station. We, we wanted uh, examples of TOD that represent the best with the highest uh, transit ridership. Uh, obviously, if a TOD is a quarter of a mile away from a transit station, fewer people are going to use uh, the, the transit station than if uh, they're literally right next to each other. So you go down you know, the stairs or the elevator in your residential uh, building, your apartment building, you go out into a street or a plaza, you, you turn right if it's Rhode Island Row, uh, you climb the stairs to the platform and then Metro, Washington Metro trains pick you up and take you probably to your workplace. So these are the criteria. As you can see, there are uh, seven of them uh, that we used originally in the original NITSI study to define uh, our sample of TODs. And here they are. They're scattered across the country. Uh, Fruitvale Village, you probably, some of you have heard of. My guess is some of you maybe from the East Coast have heard of Rhode Island Row. Wilshire, Vermont is in Los Angeles. Englewood, a TOD, Redmond TOD made up our original sample. Um, the sixth TOD we studied uh, using students from Portland State University. As, as Brendan mentioned, Portland State is the, the lead university for NITSI. Um, this is uh, a shot uh, looking down on the transit station, which is in the, at the bottom of the slide. And all the development 
that has occurred in Aranco Station since the um, uh, transit line uh, opened. Um, and it's maybe the best known TOD in the country, certainly suburban TOD, uh, Arlington, Virginia, uh, Bethesda, Maryland, and so on have great TODs, but as a standalone suburban TOD, uh, probably Arenco Station is the most well-known. We published three papers. We're happy to share the citations with you uh, on trip and parking generation at TODs. Uh, what we found through the intercept surveys done by the students uh, is that a very, very high percentage of uh, trips uh, generated by TODs are a uh, very high percentage are walking, which is shown uh, in green and transit, which is shown in blue. So up to Fr Fruitvale has uh, close to 20, uh, 70, excuse me, 70% 70 of uh, trips by Fruitvale, uh, either uh, renters, in the apartments or uh, uh, shoppers that come to Fruitvale Village for lunch or uh, to buy uh, uh, items uh, or come there because there's a, a medical clinic for, for treatment uh, for medical issues. Um, you can see uh, just how many trips aren't auto trips. Auto trips are about 30% uh, at uh, Fruitvale Village. Uh, the, the exception to the rule is down there, Station Park. And this is something I would like for you to take with you into the future from this, uh, from this particular webinar. Uh, only 10% or 9%, excuse me, of the trips in Station Park are walking or, um, or transit trips. Uh, it is not a TOD, it is a TAD, which stands for Transit Adjacent Development. It literally turns its back on the transit station. And in comparison with a Renko, uh, it's dramatic. Uh, Renko close to 70% walk and transit trips. Uh, bike trips aren't shown. Um, they're a small percentage, but they they add to the percentage of non-auto uh, trip making. This is kind of the coolest slide from our original study. I, I, I think I mentioned this, but our original study with the students doing the counts and the intercept surveys um, uh, was uh, uh, funded by NITSI also, uh, as is this study that we're talking about now. If you look at the red bar and the scale on the bottom, the typical TOD uh, has less than one space per apartment uh, for parking. That is incredibly low. Uh, I, we live in Salt Lake, Justina and I do, and the typical suburban average is two spaces uh, per apartment building. So TODs are coming in at about half the uh, parking generation of, uh, of suburban development, typical suburban apartment complexes. Um, and that tells us something about the cost of, uh, of transportation, the T and H plus T, uh, that it's gonna be much lower than in a apartment uh, complex where um, you've got two uh, cars per household. Uh, here we have less than one. So we, what we did, I'm almost done here, and then I'll turn it over to the star of this presentation, uh, Justina, uh, who's done all the work. Um, we, we have the actual rental prices uh, in that first table. And notice for a one-bedroom apartment at Redmond TOD, which is outside of Seattle, it's in Redmond. Um, you've got uh, 1,500 to uh, 2,200 uh, for a one bedroom apartment. That's high. That's not affordable for uh, low income households. 
uh, two bedroom, also high, higher. Um, when we worked out the, the math, uh, starting with the area median income, uh, a uh, moderate income household earning 80% of AMI could afford about uh, at 30% of, of their income, about $2,172 in monthly rent, which as you can see, um, makes Redmond TOD affordable uh, to a moderate income household, but a low income household uh, with 50% 50 of AMI can only afford $1,358 in rent at 30% of income. Uh, and that uh, development is not affordable for uh, low income households. Now it turns out that of the first five, four of them have uh, below market rate apartments. So in fact, 20% of the apartments in the Redmond TOD are uh, uh, designated affordable. Uh, Justina will be talking a lot more about it. So some low income households live there, but not most of them. And that's a problem because the low income households are the ones most likely to use transit. And it's kind of crazy to provide, you, know, you spend, millions of dollars on transit and you know change the zoning for multifamily when uh when most people uh who will occupy the apartments can't afford to use uh can't afford to live there and then use transit um we did a, a quick back of the envelope uh t cost analysis that's transportation cost uh, auto, an automobile, according to Bureau of Transportation Statistics, cost you $9,561 on average per year. If you work it out on a monthly basis, it's $637. Um, for automobile, that's at Redmond's level of parking occupancy, which is a 0.8 uh, spaces occupied per uh, dwelling unit per apartment. Uh, if you assume that uh, a two-person apartment will have uh, a transit pass um, because there's only one car, less than one car, actually 0.8 cars per apartment, uh, the transit is $126. So the total monthly transportation cost is $763 per month. That's back at the envelope. I, I understand the limitations of that. Um, so then when you compare it to 15% of a household's income, um, a, again, uh, using that Center for Neighborhood Technology number, 15% uh, of uh, income is affordable if spent on transportation. You can see that the monthly transportation costs that uh, can be afforded by uh, households uh, in uh, Redmond TOD is $1,086. So that's a lot more than uh, $763, which is uh, the, the cost of owning and, and using a transit pass. Uh, but uh, low income again is below at $679 uh, versus uh, a, uh, a cost of $763. So again, low-income people can't afford to live there unless their units are designated affordable and are below market. Uh, this is uh, just about the end. That's uh, for, for South in, um, in Salt Lake City. You can see the uh, transit uh, vehicle, the light rail vehicle uh, going down the median. Um, you see a uh, a three lane road uh, and you see some buildings going up. This is when uh, the uh, transit was operating. Obviously you see the transit vehicle, the uh, rail car um, and uh, they had rezoned, the city had rezoned uh, to make it very easy to build uh, mid rise apartment buildings like the, the ones on the left and the ones on the right. And so you would assume that they would provide 
a lot of riders for um, uh, for light rail, uh, but they don't. Uh, this is a uh, from a, the earlier study NITSI funded, and thank you NITSI for it. it. It it led to the three publications. It, you see, the red is uh, how many riders there are on that light rail line. And notice it goes up, 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 up to about uh, 2014, and then it starts coming down. And you notice that it, uh, the auto ownership, which is, or auto usage, which is in blue, starts at about 40,000 vehicles per day and drops dramatically when the light rail system opens and then it goes, it's kind of flat for a while and now it's going up. So you, you've got this, this question, you know, why would uh, auto uh, usage on 400 South and parallel roads go up and transit usage, usage go down when we're building TOD along 400 South and parallel streets? And the reason is we're not building TOD, we're building TAD. There's exactly one apartment building that has affordable housing of uh, the 10 or so apartment buildings that have gone up. Uh, this is typical Encore. Uh, notice the, uh, the rental uh, prices are 1800 uh, to 2000. You already know that exceeds what a low income household that would be a uh, candidate for using tracks, which is the name of our light rail system uh, could afford. Um, and um, uh, research questions that Justina will answer. I'll do these two slides, even though they're really her slides. Do housing costs uh, directly adjacent to rail stations uh, meet standards of affordability for low and moderate? Uh, what proportion of TODs in the US provide affordable housing? And what are the relative shares in designated? And uh, Justina will talk about that. These are below market units that are designated affordable versus naturally occurring affordable units. And in some regions, uh, typical apartments are affordable. The Texas, for example, has really inexpensive um, apartment buildings. Uh, what are the mechanisms? This is the most important used by TOD developers or jurisdictions to provide this affordable housing. These are the tools that those of you who are transportation planners for cities or MPOs or whatever can use. And then what uh, proportion of jurisdictions have regulatory versus voluntary uh, measures, the naturally occurring measures. And uh, this is my last slide. Um, we, we started with rail criteria. Um, we we uh, only looked at metropolitan areas with commuter rail, light rail, or heavy rail, and only looked at the stations of, of, uh, uh, on, on rail lines. Uh, that was a conscious decision. So it doesn't include um, streetcar, uh, uh, which uh, tends to have less ridership and less impact, uh, at, at least on uh, travel decisions. Uh, one rail line wasn't included. There are a few rail uh, lines around the country systems that have only one line. We wanted more complete uh, rail systems. Uh, we identified regions that met those two criteria. There are 26 of them. We contacted MPOs transit operators in major cities in the uh, 26 regions to get a list of potential TODs. We would have usually a telephone conversation or uh, search their websites and uh, see if they had TODs um, near stations. And then we, uh, as we said, we, we interviewed the planners and said, what do you have that meets our eight criteria? Uh, and the transit operators proved most knowledgeable. They know the TODs in their region that are adjacent to stations, that are dense, that are mixed use, et cetera. So with that, I'll turn it over to Justina. Um, hi, everyone. So um, 
click here we go so this is uh we oh what did happen i can let me see <laughs> what did I, happen? I turned i turned it over to you um but you no, still are you know seeing... i will what why, why don't i uh Advanced I will share slides. my own slides. I think that will be okay. just easier. I'm okay. sorry. Uh, so here we go here. And then I'll share them. I think it's just going to be easier for me. Okay, so this is the map uh, of that shows all 183 potential TODs that we eventually that we initially um, uh, initially uh, identified. Then what we did, we basically looked at them and, and, and tried to see how many of them adhere to our eight criteria. Remember, we talked about seven criteria. For this study, we added additional one. We wanted to make sure that those TODs were master planned or basically uh, included more than one building, that there were actually communities. What we ended up were 85 TODs which consists, consists of 117 individual projects that are located in 23 regions, 42 counties, 51 cities. I will explain shortly why it matters that there are in that many counties, cities, uh, and that there are that many individual projects. So when we move on, this is the map of all the TODs in the country as we define them and uh, you know, according to our criteria. One, two things that we want to clarify up front: a transit station is not the same as TOD, which means there could be more than one TODs at any given transit station. Secondly, a TOD does not mean one project. Any given TOD can consist of more than one project that, that could be developed by different entities in different uh, time periods. Just to demonstrate what we mean, this is an example of Boston's North Station. As you can see, adjacent to that one station are four self-contained separate TODs. Second concept, TODs are not the same as individual projects. Here and here's an example of, a, of MacArthur Station in Oakland, California. It is a master community, as you can see here in the corner the right left, right uh, uh, bottom corner. It, it, it was de developed by block by three different developers at different time. Right from the beginning, the block, D block, which is, shows as bridge housing was meant to be developed as affordable housing. And it indeed is a hundred percent affordable uh, project that one block D. Going on, here we go. So what did we do? How did we, you know, how did we find all the data? Actually research involved a um, huge amount of, uh, uh, of a uh, number of different documents. So it involved, uh, you know, identifying and reviewing a large number of municipal, county and state websites, zoning codes, policy guidelines, websites of various transit operators, as well as guidelines and reports prepared by them. We also looked at any database we found that is kept by uh, different programs and cities uh, to monitor affordable housing. That includes a HUD uh, database that monitors LIHTC uh, funded uh, projects. Uh, then we also looked at transit-oriented development and housing affordability status reports prepared by various governing bodies, as well as tax credit allocation memos, and basically any official communication we were able to find that confirmed that, you know, a given amount of an, or a number of units were affordable. And then at the end, I mean, and we also, the research also uh, consisted of conducting hundreds of phone inquiries. What did we find? Uh, this slide talks only about designated affordable housing. Designated affordable housing is deed restricted 
housing that was produced either by nonprofit developers or in response to very specific city, county, or state uh, requirements, regulations, and policies. What we found is on a, that on average, on average, 13% of units um, in TODs is designated as affordable. However, there is a very, very large variation. It go, on this slide, we only show uh, 23 regions. Remember that in, in each region, there are TODs, and in, in each TOD, there are projects, individual projects. So if we look at the project level, it goes from 100% to 0%. On average, half, per, half of the TODs have at least some of their units designated as low income. When you look at the, at the diagram and you see the difference between zero and 61, what makes a huge difference is single projects that are actually 100% affordable. But we'll talk about it later. Just the thing to remember, 13% on average, 13% uh, of units at TODs are designated affordable housing. However, there is a huge variation between TODs, individual product, projects, and regions. Then we looked at naturally occurring affordable housing. First, I just want to introduce the concept and explain a little what it means. Naturally occurring affordable housing, it's units that are market rate, but they happen to be affordable to households earning about 70 to 80% of AMI. There are some instances, some regions where naturally occurring affordable housing is uh, affordable to, to um, uh, to households earning less, but these are very unique instances. 7% um, is not a lot because on average, when you look at city, cities, and there's been, there's been studies done on that, in cities, in well, you know, sort of established uh, cities, on average, naturally occurring affordable housing accounts for up to 85% of affordable housing. So when we look at TODs and we see only 7%, that's not much. Uh, so when we conduct the study, which was July of 2021, we found that 40% of the TODs had some naturally occurring affordable, uh, not, not naturally occurring affordable housing units. This is a slide that shows combined numbers. So seven plus 13 is 20. So Overall, on average, TUDs offer 20% of their um, housing as affordable. But when we look at it at individual TUDs, it goes from yet again zero to 100. Some TUDs are 100% naturally affordable. Some TUDs are not TUDs, projects, excuse me, project. Some projects are 100% naturally affordable. Some projects are 100% designated affordable some have no affordable housing at all, right? So there's a huge amount of variation. Generally, regions have either or, very few have no affordable housing. So you would have, you know, like Texas has relatively, uh, it's relatively affordable. Uh, so there are many, many units, up to 100% of the units are naturally affordable, which means there'll be very few units that are designated affordable. As we mentioned before, just saying, repeating it again, what makes a huge difference are single projects within uh, regions that are 100% affordable, and they drive the affordability for, um, for cases that we show here. Once we identified the numbers of units that are affordable, what we looked at were mechanisms or interventions that were used to produce them. What we found was that those interventions, which usually, uh, usually are some form of inclusionary housing or zoning, however, there are other forms of uh, other types of policies as well, but usually they're in that, in that type. There, at, they're introduced, they're designed at city level, most of them. So only one was at the county level that was in New Jersey and two were at state levels. 
which means most of those policies are at city level. And for that reason, we're very um, context dependent and fragmented and localized. What we have also found was that um, over the past uh, over the past decade, maybe there's a increased public involvement through city and uh, mostly city measures and mostly inclusionary housing. However, um, I would say that most of them were uh, actually in, actually um, introduced after the TODs we examined in the studies were built. So they didn't make much difference for the TODs that we examined. They might make some difference for the future. Uh, nonetheless, for the TODs that were subject to citywide inclusionary housing or zoning or other type of policy, those regulatory measures um, produced very limited impact on average five to 10% of uh, housing as affordable. And those units that were produced through, through those measures were uh, affordable to households um, of moderate income, that is 60 to 80% of the AMI. And I will talk about it later because it is counterintuitive. We sort of, expect, we sort of expected as well that those units will be affordable to low income uh, households, but we'll talk about it a little later. Um, all the projects that are that we looked at that are 100% affordable, and there are a handful of them, were built uh, using public funding, and most of them use uh, low income tax, uh, low income housing tax credit uh, funding. But not only, they usually use more than 10 sources of funding and you know, take two years to, uh, to sort of uh, get off, off, off the ground. Um, we also found that there, are, as of now, as of last July, I'll, I would say, there are no measures designed specifically to promote or incentivize or regulate production of affordable housing in TODs. But over past few years, increasingly so, transit authorities or transit operators have been, um, have been introducing uh, policies that uh, promote uh, the production of affordable housing, more specifically on land owned by them, by the authorities or operators, uh, which will also uh, demonstrate in some of the case studies we'll show. Uh, in addition, when we look at projects that uh, have been uh, built recently, uh, as opposed to those built 10, 20 years ago, those built recently uh, are more affordable, which means a higher share of them um, for affordable housing and uh, the share of affordable housing within individual projects is actually higher. This is a very busy chart, but what it shows is a sample of uh, measures that were used by, uh, by the TODs, not TODs, the cities that TODs operate in, right? That we looked at. The, the upper uh, half focuses on what we called top-down approaches, but these are mostly uh, different variations of um, inclusionary housing and zoning. Uh, Left-hand side is inclusionary housing because there are policies that are mostly voluntary. Right-hand side is zoning, uh, which is uh, mandatory. As we said, um, they produce housing that is affordable to households earning approximately 70 to 80% of the AMI. The bottom half is something that we call bottom-up approaches. They're actually more successful in terms of affordability, but these include nonprofit developers, CDCs, so community development corporations, transit operators policies also because they often, they often offer uh, um, land leases at uh, preferential rates. Uh, uh, and sometimes cities also, not, not even transit operators, but sometimes cities also offer their land a preferential 
rates or for free for affordable housing. Uh, and these, the bottom half uh, measures, end up producing low income housing, meaning affordable to households earning less than 50% of their EMI. Just to recap, uh, just to make it clear. So when we look at projects, some of them, a uh, small share, about 40%, are 100% affordable. These projects, the 100% the 100 affordable projects produce housing that is affordable to low income households, 50 to 60% of their MI. Most of, well, in our, in our um, sample, actually 100% of them were built using low income uh, housing tax credit in addition to other uh, forms of funding. The bottom uh, part of this slide shows all the other designated affordable housing produced in TODs that was produced in response to some sort of regulation, mostly inclusionary housing or zoning. And that produces housing affordable to, in, to moderate income households on average 70 to 80% of the AMI. Now, we did not understand why that happened. This was, this was not what we, would, what we expected. So we looked further and we found two studies that were done in 2017 and 20 respectively. And they carried out very comprehensive study of inclusionary housing produced in the United States. Uh, this is a very busy uh, chart, which I don't expect to go through and I will not, but this is the second study conducted in 2020. And I will just highlight some numbers. So basically there were over 700 jurisdictions that had inclusionary housing, over 1000 programs uh, that in total produced 100, about 110,000 units and collected $1.8 billion uh, in impact fees, which translate roughly to 9,000 units. But what is more important and more telling to us was that when we look at those uh, programs, only seven of them nationwide, seven produced housing affordable to uh, households earning less than or 50% of the AMI, uh, which means that uh, those, uh, you know, those strategies, those mechanisms, inclusionary housing or zoning, it does not on average produce housing for low income uh, units. It's still good that it produces housing for, you know, for those earning at about 80%, but it's not successful. It is not successful at producing in, uh, housing for those earning uh, about 50% of the AMI. In contrast, when, when we looked at data on, on uh, uh, LIHTC uh, funded uh, housing, in 2019, there were 2.4 million housing units that were produced through a uh, low income housing tax credit. Um, and this is basically uh, mirrored in our study. This is exactly what we saw that uh, the, and uh, th th these units produced with uh, light tech funding are actually affordable to, to low and, uh, and very low and extremely low households. So this is what we saw in our study that the 100% the, the affordable project that I talked about that were funded with uh, light tech funding, they are affordable to households earning 50, 60% of the AMI. And the ones produced with, through any type of, uh, uh, low in, any type of affordable uh, um, inclusionary housing or inclusionary zoning are affordable to households earning 70 to 80% of the AMI. Uh, Reed, you wanted to add some, because this is the last slide we're gonna present. So I thought hey. Reed wanted to add something at the end. Uh, am I? Can oh, you hear sorry. Me? There's one more slide. There's oh, one yeah. more slide. That sorry, this one uh, sort of sums up what we just talked about in one case study that demonstrates all of the aspects we just talked about. So this is a very well known um, 
TOD that actually we talked about in the beginning of our presentation, the Fruitvale Village. Interestingly enough, in what we talked about in that particular TOD, there was the highest share of uh, walking and I think uh, transit trips. This is also the one that ends up being uh, very affordable. However, that's the journey they went through. Phase one of the project was only 20% affordable, but that was only 10 units. And that was probably partially uh, in response to uh, inclusionary housing policy. It was uh, built by a nonprofit uh, developer, the Unity Council. Then phase two was slightly more affordable. 26% of the units were affordable. It was still uh, built by, uh, by, by two non-profit de non developers who joined their efforts. And it was also supported by, by, by city and county and state funding. In, fa in phase three though, they, they managed to make their, their project 100% affordable. And that was because uh, in addition to nonprofit developers, they secured uh, a number of public uh, funding sources, including low income tax, uh, low income housing tax credit, and they built on city owned land uh, where they were able to get a preferential long term um, lease. Reed, now I'm turning it to you. Because yeah, that really, awesome. really quickly. I, according to my watch, uh, we have 15 minutes. So I'm going to take one minute of the 15 uh, to sort of summarize this. I, I This is editorializing a little bit, but I think it's absolutely insane for uh, the transit operator to spend hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to extend rail transit, for example, here in Salt Lake City from downtown out to the university. And then the city to rezone land to make it super easy to build mid-rise apartment buildings, usually with uh, some sort of first floor retail uh, and have the apartments be luxury apartments that uh, uh, have ample parking uh, and uh, do not generate transit trips. Um, so Justina and I may disagree a little bit on this, but I, I'm very uh, much a proponent of inclusionary zoning and housing. Uh, if you're, and, and we're, get, we're seeing that, uh, Liberty, Boulevard on 400 South has, I think, I can't remember if it's 10 or 20% uh, below market or units, um, but all the others don't. They're providing luxury housing, which does not generate transit trips on along a very expensive transit line. And uh, the city of Salt Lake uh, has, uh, done some development agreements and so on, but generally uh, the apartment buildings that are being built uh, right next to transit stations are not affordable for those people who are most likely to use transit. So I, I think, um, you know, I, we've said this before, but uh, that, that, that inclusionary housing should be part and parcel of those rezonings that occur uh, around transit stations. We have transit uh, station area zoning. We require no parking, no uh, uh, parking at all on those. And those should be, uh, should include affordable housing units. So uh, that's my editorial and uh, we're ready for questions and, and answers, mostly directed at Justina, I think. Because <laughs> she's well, the one who knows more. Yeah, thank thank you both so much. Um, really appreciate this. We have a, a good crowd here, um, but there still is some time to submit your questions in the Q and A. So, 
uh, get those in right now. I think to me, um, listening to this and looking at some of the questions that have come in, I, I sort of feel like one of the main things is the variation um, in the TOD. So we had a question about how would you plan, like how can you learn about planning a TOD? And I'm, I think you, in, without getting into the, the details, I think you gave some good resources in your slides. Um, the, the slide, particularly housing affordability mechanisms that showed the top down and the bottom up. And then you also include some studies. So I just want to let the audience know on the project website and on the web, there, there's a link to the webinar website. And through our email, you'll also be getting these slides. Um, so you can check that out. You can check out the um, final report for this project and the two page project brief. But Reed, is there any other sort of resource you would uh, suggest? It seems to me that the vari variation is, is great. Yeah, I, I, th I think it is. Uh, so, so I would say, uh, Brendan, that, that uh, your, um, your audience should look at both of the NITSI projects that, uh, that we completed, the trip and parking generation study, which suggests that, and this is going to sound uh, wild, but that uh, TODs generate about half as many trips as suburban development that is otherwise comparable in terms of number of units or square feet of retail or whatever. They generate about half as many trips and they require about half as many parking spaces. So as cities are uh, approving uh, TODs, um, they shouldn't be applying suburban standards because you will end up with 100% more uh, parking spaces than are really needed. Uh, and if you charge impact fees, you'll end up charging about twice as much in impact fees as uh, is warranted by a trip generation uh, of TODs. Um, Justina knows the literature better than I do. Uh, do you wanna say something about other uh, resources, Justina, that uh, the audience might wanna look at? Um, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of, it's not only, you know, uh, limited to uh, resources on TODs, but also on natural affordable. To me, the, the concept of naturally occurring affordable housing is probably the most interesting now because it's the, it's the vast majority of affordable housing units in the city and we don't know much about it. So whoever I think is a planning should just reach out and try to educate themselves on uh, how we define them and most importantly, how we protect them, because you know, once we lose them, they're gone and they're very, very difficult to replace. So if somehow we can protect them and also in proximity to TODs, because you know, when we think about it, 80% of naturally 80% of affordable housing is not actually naturally occurring affordable housing. And then if we want to me, if we want to create a housing that is affordable to low income individuals, it is very difficult to do it without some sort of public how, uh, public uh, funding. And it's, you know, uh, or a low income, uh, house, low income housing tax uh, credit. I mean, it's impossible. And we've also talked to a number to, of developers for other studies and they repeatedly say it, you know, it's extremely difficult. It is doable to produce housing for, for households uh, earning 80% of the AMI, but it's very difficult for those who earn um, less than 50% of the AMI. Yeah, and I, I will say one more thing in terms of resources. Brendan, I don't know how you distribute this, but we did a survey of 10 cities uh, in Utah. It's just Utah, which obviously, you know, is, is a unique state. But uh, we looked at 
a whole bunch of affordable housing tools like, uh, like inclusionary zoning, uh, like density bonuses, like uh, waiver of impact fees. Uh, and we found that uh, the cities, these 10 largest cities aren't using many of the affordable housing tools that exist. And we could send you a copy of that report and you could maybe post it as a, an appendix to uh, our, our final report for you and, um, uh, and the PowerPoint that I think you're going to post. But yeah. on one of our slides, we also have that busy slide with all the, all the measures. If somebody just wants to go and look them up, it's, you know, it's, it's educational because they're all different. They're all very different and they have a little different approaches, a little different thresholds, you know, it, you know as a matter of just uh, seeing what other cities do. And one last thing, density bonuses, which I just mentioned, go hand in hand with affordable housing that, uh, and, and so does, uh, so does TIF. Uh, in in uh, our, our city doesn't require inclusionary zoning, but uh, has used density bonuses uh, in the past to reward developers that provide affordable housing. And that could be one good way to get into the affordable housing business uh, in, in TODs. Great, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so another thing uh, that's in addition to the variation, I think, is the different people that are involved in in all of this. And I'm wondering, with your interactions, um, not just obviously with city and state, but also developers, um, what's their thinking towards the future? I mean, are we are we sharing sort of common ground? Well, I, I think uh, this is a, another project. We're analyzing the impact of what's called the S line, which is a streetcar line uh, in Sugar House, which is a, uh, a center of activity uh, south of downtown here. And we've been interviewing developers and uh, most of the developers uh, along the S line are not providing any affordable housing, but one of them is Cowboy Partners. And uh, it's, we, we will have at some point a final report from that project, which includes the interviews with developers. And um, uh, Cowboy Partners has found that using the low income housing tax credit and using density bonuses uh, and using uh, subsidies from the transit agency, uh, it can produce uh, affordable housing right on the S line. Uh, so I, I think the final point I would make is that there are, it's a whole toolbox, toolbox of tools and uh, what Justina found is that in the typical project, they're using several tools and several uh, financing sources and so on. So it becomes extremely complicated to put together these TOD deals with the affordable housing. So if you, if you take it on, you can do it, but expect it's going to be a challenge. And what we have done to uh, not to produce affordable housing, but to get a lot built along the streetcar line, the S line, is change the administrative process. Uh, to do a uh, development along the S line, you only require staff approval. Uh, you don't have to go to uh, the planning commission. You don't have to go to the city council. Uh, and that is really more than anything else what is producing all the housing, multifamily, not affordable housing, but, but could be affordable uh, along our transit lines. That's both streetcar and light rail. 
Great. Um, okay, so we are out of time. Um, are there any points either of you would like to make um, before we wrap this up? Well, just just to thank Nitzi, um, you know, this, um, this research, particularly the uh, early research, where we were hiring students, like at Orenco Station, we hired 60 students uh, or 58, whatever it was, uh, to do the, in a, the surveys and do the uh, counts of people and counts of cars and so on. And that's where the finding that these TODs are really, really great, uh, the ones that are right next to stations, in terms of trip generation and parking generation. And, you know, it would have been hard to find another sponsor for a study like that, but NITSI uh, has provided funding for all sorts of worthwhile research that otherwise wouldn't be funded. So uh, that's just a, a thank you note to you, Brendan, and, and the, the others, Jennifer, and so on. Well, thank you, Reed and Justina. This is this has been great. Um, really appreciate you presenting today, and appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, so, with that, um, we'll wrap it up. And I encourage people to check out our other webinars, Friday transportation seminars, as well for some other great presentations by NITSI and transportation professionals um, that that we work with. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Reed and Justine again. Um, take care. Our pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to everyone. Bye.